Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you. I'm accompanied by my dear friend and fantastic pianist, Bill Wolfram. Now, many of you know Bill. Bill has been here three or four times, I think, but you might remember the occasion of his first being here when we had Andre Watts on our program and Andre was ill and unable to come and Bill substituted on very short notice for Beethoven Emperor and it was glorious. And since then, we've seen him on our stage a number of times and it's always a great week for us. This week for me has been a, an adventure because I'm doing a piece I've never done before. Bill co completely convinced me to do this work. Now, Tchaikovsky, you saw Tchaikovsky on the program. This is not the Tchaikovsky number one, the one that we've done, I don't know, thousands of times. Um, and uh, the one that is very well known. This is the second one, uh, written for the same pianist, which I think is interesting. Some of you might remember when we talked about the, the Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto, that he wrote it for Nicholas Rubinstein, and uh, who was the great, I guess at that time, the greatest Russian pianist. Um, and Rubinstein hated the piece, and uh, actually campaigned against it, said it was unplayable and it was, you know, no one should ever play this. And well, three or four years later, he was actually learning it so that he could play it. So he changed his mind. And, um, and Tchaikovsky forgave him and wrote this piece for Rubinstein. So Rubinstein was going to give the premiere of the second piano concerto and unfortunately died right before he was going to play it. So, so um, I, I'm going to ask Bill, because Bill was the one who first told me about this, and he completely convinced me to do it. And I am so happy, Bill. I mean, it's been, it's been a great adventure. As I said, it's been a thrill to be on the stage in the middle of this piece. So tell us how you came to love it so much. Yeah, I, I actually, I really do prefer it to the first. I mean, the first is a wonderful work. Um, the second has a really interesting history in how it's been changed and how it's been used. Um, I actually, I actually have known about it and played it many, many times, but not in the version that you're going to hear today. Um, there are a lot of piano concerti that are actually phenomenal works that are known, that are, that are actual staples in the world of ballet. And they're not known in, in the concert world for some reason. This is one of these works. The Tchaikovsky Second Piano Concerto uh, was used by George Balanchine. And it is, uh, most standard repertory ballet companies and big ones will at least put in, put on Ballet Imperial, that's the name of it, once a year at least. And when I was younger, I got into this circuit of playing for certain ballet companies in the pit. You know, it's a very different experience. It's in the pit, so you're under, underground, and they're not paying me for my interpretation. I am watching the conductor, and the conductor is watching the dancer. So it's a very different, very different experience. Not always totally satisfying for the musicians. Sometimes, but sometimes deeply unsatisfying. <laughs> um, but I think the main interest about this piece is that Tchaikovsky, the way Tchaikovsky wrote it, this concerto, and intended it, is what you're going to hear today. And it, there are some odd things about it. Um, it's long. Um, by normal standards. It's longer than the traditional like 20, 25 minute, 30, 35 minute concerto. I don't think it feels that way, but um, the first movement has a lot of piano cadences in it. One huge one, one normal size one, and one small one, and that's unusual. Um, the, the most unusual aspect of this concerto in its original form, as you will hear today, is the second movement. Uh, Tchaikovsky gave the piano in the second movement actually very little to do um, for, for a normal concerto format where the soloist usually is you know, almost always working. And he gave the lion's share of the beautiful melody in the slow movement to the violin and the cello. And it's a really, it's one of his most beautiful duets and it's so apparent that this is a sort of a soloistic duo that you'll see choreography that you don't usually see in a, in a concerto format. And you'll, see the, you'll see the violinist get up out of his orchestral position to start the second movement, stand, and you'll see the cellist come forward and sit in front of the piano. So it's almost like a piano trio 
arrangement because the cello would have been buried, you know, there, there's, the, the, the beautiful melodies that, that he's playing, he or she is playing, would be buried in the orchestral position, so they have to come forward. Now this was revised by a Liszt student, Alexander Zolotti, because he thought, look, here's a piano concerto and the pianist is, you know, sitting it out in the slow movement. This is ridiculous, we're gonna give the piano all the juicy stuff. So he did. And that's the version that Balanchine used. So that's the ballet version, that's the one that I did. And honestly, it's a blast to play all those gorgeous melodies. Um, this is really, on some level, this is just really better. Um, this, is, this is the way Tchaikovsky intended it, and there's a letter that he wrote, I'm forgetting the details, but the, the main thrust of it is, is kind of heartbreaking. He's, he's writing a friend or a publisher, I, I forgot. He's writing someone about this oddity in his second concerto with the second movement, knowing that the piano is very little and that he's, he's essentially farmed out all the, all the uh, treasures to stringed instruments in a piano concerto. And he's saying, when I die, I really do not want this to be monkeyed with and changed. You know, someone's going to try to do this. I don't want that. So it's kind of heartbreaking, you know, and immediately after his death, of course, that's what happened. Um, so you're hearing the right stuff today. And um, it's a sensational piece. I mean, it, for some bizarre reason, it's just not done that much. You know, there's another, I was thinking of this last night, Tchaikovsky actually wrote, to my knowledge, four piano concertos. Uh, the third is amazing. It's a one-movement work that's also, um, that's Allegro Brilliant. That's another Balanchine staple. Um, it's essentially one melody, but it's worth it. It's one gorgeous melody. Uh, then there's a concerto called Concert Fantasy, and in my humble opinion, it, it's not quite on the level that the other three are, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy this piece. It's fabulous. Almost everybody does, and they always go away saying, you know, how come we don't hear that? And just for the record, I think it's mostly Western, uh, the Western world that doesn't hear it. I know in the, uh, behind the Iron Curtain, you know, in the Soviet Union, Tchaikovsky too was, you know, a staple of their concert repertoire. But, you know, just not here. So maybe we can start a trend. Well, it's, as you see, can see, what you'll see from Bill's thundering performance, it's a very difficult and exhausting piece. So maybe that's one of the reasons. And also, Bill has been extremely generous about sharing the stage with both Michael and Roman, neither of which needed much convincing to come right up there. <laughs> They're loving it, so. But it's, no, it's great. That's true, actually. It is, I find it to be the most exhausting piano concerto that I've played, and, and I've, there have been some others that were close to it, like uh, John Corgliano piano concerto, a, a fantastic uh, contemporary, well, living composer. You've heard works uh, of his performed yeah. here. Uh, but his piano concerto is, Oh, that, if you're tired for that, don't try. Um, but I find this one even worse, which is, I should tell Corgliano that, it'll make him jealous, you know? <laughs> that a concerto written so long ago is even it's more, more difficult. It's even more just, it's, it's not, I'm not even, I'm not saying it's like technically more difficult, but it's just, it's, it's so deeply physical. There's so much. Which you'll see. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's always different levels of difficulty. Some of the most difficult piano music in the world was written by Franz Schubert, and you don't sweat at all. It's all... It's all inner, sort of refined difficulties of touch, and, but it's not, it's not this physical, you know, this Tchaikovsky has a real athletic sporting thing to it. You're using, you know, shoulder, and there's a lot of volume, and, you know, you just, you get out of breath, and you're tired. It's that simple, so, but it's, it's fun. It's very thrilling to be on the stage when you're playing this. It really is for all of us, and uh, we've had a great week with Bill, so... Thank you. Thank and we're going to so let him much. do a little bit of resting before he has to tackle this. <laughs> but thank you, and you're in for an enormous treat. Thank you all. Thank you. It really is special for me always to work with Bill, but, but to do a new piece with him has been really a treat. The rest of the program also, I think, is going to be unfamiliar for you. Um, we are working, as you probably know, this spring on the music of Joseph Sook. Joseph Sook, who's overshadowed by his very famous father-in-law, Antonin Dvorak. Uh, but we're working on that because we are going to make a Naxos CD. Actually, tomorrow, we come back on Monday in the hall and, and record this music for Naxos. Um, it is such beautiful music. It, it's really sad that it's not 
better known, and I hope you agree. So you already heard some of you, The Violent Fantasy, a couple of weeks ago, and now we're here with the first half of this program are two pieces by Joseph Sook. So to tell you a little bit more about Sook, um, he was born in Bohemia, and was one of the, the many, many musical voices of Czechoslovakia, that whole region. I think I told you that I was astonished the first time I went to Prague to realize what a musical history that country had. I mean, the, the, it's, it's amazing from Stamitz to Fibic to Smetna, Janacek, um, Dvorak, of course, even, even uh, Gustav Mahler was born in Bohemia. So there's such a treasure of music there. It's a very musical place. And Joseph Sook was in that wonderful lineage, born in 1874. Um, and his music is, is, of course, Czech. I mean, you'll hear a lot of Czech references and, and beautiful sense of this bohemian countryside. But it's very individual, too. And he borrows a lot of the inspiration from German composers like Richard Strauss and also some of the great Russian composers like Rimsky-Korsakov. Uh, Sook joined... I went to the Prague Conservatory in 1891, and he enrolled in the class of Antonin Dvorak, uh, who immediately recognized that this was an extremely gifted student, and he became his favorite student. So it was quite common that he would come over the house sometimes, and he would visit his teacher and, and have dinner with the family, and he met Dvorak's daughter Otilka when she was 14 years old. And, uh, and really liked her. And soon afterwards, Dvorak actually came with his family, bringing Otilka with him, of course, to New York, where he spent three weeks living in the United States, three years, sorry, living in the United States, uh, working in New York City as the director of what became the Juilliard School. Um, a wonderful time for our country to have Dvorak here in, in the United States. Well, he was very homesick, as I think I might have told you, so he eventually went back to Prague. And Otilka was then 17 and a beautiful young woman, and Joseph Suk realized how much he had missed her, and, um, and they, be, they were married. And it was a very idyllic marriage, a very happy time for him, a um, really happy period of his life. And the three pieces that we're recording to, that you'll hear today are written in that very happy period. Um, you will play the Scherzo Fantastique and Fairy Tale. These pieces are marked by beautiful melodies, really colorful orchestration, a kind of rhythmic vitality, which is sometimes Czech rhythms that you hear, wonderful harmonies, and it's nationalistic, and it's also uh, individual at the same time. But at the age of 31, uh, Suk's life was torn apart. First of all, in, in 1904, his um, Otilka died, his wife died, from which he never recovered, and the next year Dvorak himself died. So after that period, his music became much darker, um, sort of a, an endless quest to find the meaning of life. His most famous later work is an Azrael symphony, Azrael being the, uh, the angel of death, in which he, he just is a searing lament on this, these losses that he never recovered from, both Otilka and Antonin Dvorak. But these pieces, again, are from a happier time. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the fairy tale first, because I think that that's maybe the one that is the most, uh, most interesting to listen for. He, he wrote this piece, um, the fairy tale, as incidental music to a play. It was a play about a fairy tale by um, Zaire uh, called Radus and Mahulena. It was a very famous fairy tale in the the bohemian tradition and um, and the music of course the play was was acted out and the music was in between and i guess sook realized as many many composers have that the music was not going to have much of a life if the play was not given a lot which it wouldn't be so he extracted some of the music and put it into a suite four movements all drawn from this play so that he we would have a chance to hear it in, in the concert hall um, the story is, uh, just to tell you briefly, um, the Prince Raduz is in a, he's hunting and he's in a neighboring kingdom and he accidentally kills a deer that belongs to the, the king and queen of this other territory. And the queen Runa, who's a, is a very malicious and terrible queen, is so furious that she imprisons him and she's going to kill him for, for accidentally killing this deer. But her daughter, um, 
uh, is falls in love with him. Mahalina falls in love with this young prince, and she helps him escape. Uh, the the queen is infuriated, so she casts an evil spell on 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 first on the father of the prince so that he dies. The prince loses his father from this terrible spell. And then she casts a spell on the two young lovers. Um, she imprisons Mahulena in a poplar tree. Her spirit is caught in this tree. And she causes, um, that's her daughter, she imprisons her daughter in the tree, and she causes the young prince to lose all of his memory so he doesn't know who he is, he doesn't remember Mahulena, and he's just wandering, wandering in the forests. Uh, towards the end of the of the story, he's wandering and he comes comes upon this poplar tree, and for some reason he has a kind of a magnetic feeling about this tree. He doesn't know why, but he's fixated on this tree and he and he's seized with this with this intent that he must chop this tree down. He must chop this tree down, although he doesn't know why. And he begins to chop the tree, and the tree starts to bleed. And when the blood touches his hand, the spell is broken, and Mahulena's spirit is released, and she comes back to him, and he remembers everything. So they're reunited at the end, and the queen dies. So without a lot of the details, that's the story, the fairy tale. Um, and you'll hear little parts of this in the music. The first movement is called uh, The Love and Sorrows of the Prince and the Princess talking about Radu's and Mahulena, uh, and has a fantastic violin solo, beautiful solo that Michael plays. That is the solo uh, of uh, Mahulena. That's the spirit, the character of Mahulena, this beautiful solo. Um, and interestingly enough, when much later in life, when Sook wrote that, that very sad and tragic Azrael symphony, he took that melody and he used it to represent his deceased wife. So that later played a role as representing Otilka and a much sadder time. The second movement is a dance, the, a little dance that the, the two of them are doing in the forest. It's a kind of a polka. It's very Czech. It could be one of Dvorak's Slavonic dances, maybe, as you hear this, um, filled with really felicitous writing for woodwinds, which is a specialty of, of the Czech, I think, Czech composers. The third movement is the tragic moment when the king dies, when Raduz's father, Prince Raduz's father dies. And this is, this is a beautiful, beautiful lament. Uh, Sook also borrowed this movement and used it in that Azrael symphony to memorialize Dvorak, so it was, was, who was his king. Um, so these, these pieces, this piece, music had a second life. The fourth movement is taken from the moment when um, and the prince is seized with this, this need to chop down this tree. So when you hear this violent, uh, very forceful music at the end of the fourth movement, that is the prince chopping down this tree. Uh, and at the end, when he releases the spirit of his beloved Mahulena, the solo comes back. So you'll know that moment too. But it's very, very beautiful music from a man who's not very well known. Uh, the scherzo also is, is, is a gorgeous reflection, really, of bohemian life in a way. Um, Sook had a, 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 another very active role in his life. He played for 40 years in a quartet that he founded called the Bohemia Quartet. And this is a very, very busy quartet. Um, I read that they were actually playing 300 concerts a year, which is hard to imagine, but, but they played everywhere in that region, the Bohemia Quartet. And he was the second violinist in the quartet. And uh, I was talking to a, a, a Sook scholar who told me that because Sook spent so much time playing second violin in the quartet, that that influenced how he wrote for the second violinist in the orchestra. He had a special affection for the second violinist, for these interior voices. You know, very often we're dazzled by the melody of the first violins, but it's the second violins that are controlling the harmonies. They're controlling really the emotion that we get from the music because it comes from them. Uh, and I asked Jackie and Antoine, our, our principals in the first hand, uh, if they found that. And they said that, that they did. In fact, they feel that all of the Czech composers we had the beautiful quality of, of spending more attention, giving more attention to the inner voices, the second players, the second violins, the second woodwinds, and, and that's really true. So we're giving you a preview today of this, um, 
wonderful recording that we're really looking forward to doing. So we hope that you enjoy discovering maybe the more of the music of Joseph Sook. We have a little tradition that in the spring, generally, I try and introduce to you the new members of the Buffalo Philharmonic. Now, these, these three people have been with us all year, but they're still new. They've only been, this is their first year with us. And I wanted you to get to know them a little bit. Some of you, depending on where you sit, might see them, but some of you might not be able to see them close up. So let's welcome our three new players, and I'll introduce them to you. Welcome, and these are three men that you have seen all year and you've enjoyed their playing all year, but, but now you get to know a little bit about them. Uh, Matt Bassett is probably one of the most visible ones because you see him on timpani, yes, right? Matt has joined us this year on timpani. Um, and uh, the timpani is such an important part of, of our music making because in a way it's the, the foundation, both harmonically and in terms of the sound of the orchestra, the timpani lays the groundwork. I mean, I can actually feel when I'm on the podium, the stage vibrating, depending upon the, the timpani and, and the intonation of the timpani and the sound quality. So, so Matt has brought his, his idea of sound and his, his, uh, his great talent here to, to become our timpanist. So I'm gonna ask him to tell you a little bit about his background and... Sure, well, I, um, I grew up just down the road in Cleveland um, which, as you know, is a great music town. And I was really lucky in that both my parents were um, avid music fans, um, both of them amateur singers um, in church, choir, and um, choral societies. So I grew up around a lot of music and um, was taken to many concerts, of course, kicking and screaming when I was younger, I imagine, um, and had the um, requisite forced piano lessons, which I didn't do very well at, and I still never did, even at conservatory when I had to take keyboard classes. I was, I was still terrible at it, but thankfully I was good at something else. Um, I got started playing percussion, frankly, because there was a, an older boy down the street from me who had a drum set, and I thought that was really cool. <laughs> um, so I wanted to take drum lessons, and um, for Christmas one year I got a snare drum, and and lessons, and that kind of got me started. Now, um, I certainly had, I was drawn to orchestral music and rhythm from an unusually early age. I don't know that there's many fourth graders who um, go to the library, and I found a book that had actually all nine Beethoven symphonies in mini score. It had like four pages to a page. See those. Right. <laughs> it's like this big, you practically need a magnifying glass to, um, to see it. But, um, but I actually, in the fourth grade, got that out. I was kind of enamored of the fact that I could read music and I could follow a, a whole score and I liked seeing how everything worked together. And my parents did have an old, um, well, I grew up with um, records. Many of you may remember long playing records. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, so we actually had the George Zell set with the Cleveland Orchestra, and so I was listening to Beethoven symphonies with score in the fourth grade. And interestingly enough, I was just thinking about this, the, the one that really caught my ear was Beethoven 7, which we're playing this summer, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, at any rate, uh, eventually I uh, was able to um, get in touch with um, some serious concert percussion students at the Cleveland Institute of Music and as, as teachers, my earlier teachers focused on Snerderman, and kind of a traditional percussion, beginning percussion, but that really got me turned on to it. And uh, in high school I started going to summer music festivals, which um, in talking to many of my colleagues, of course, summer music festivals are really the place where most of us get really into um, playing. So uh, I went to the Brevard Festival in uh, my high school years and uh, just got really turned on, got to play so many great pieces of music. And, um, and really from that point on, from about the 10th grade, I knew that what I wanted to do was, was have a full-time job playing timpani in an orchestra, which is an unusual goal for a 10th grader, but, um, but finally, after a long time, it, it worked out. 
<laughs> well, to, lucky for us, Matt. We're very, very happy about this. And you're moving to Buffalo. Right now you're still commuting. Right. I've, right now I'm kind of in between Cleveland and Buffalo. My wife has a teaching job. Um, she's an elementary music teacher and is finishing out the school year. And once that finishes up, we'll be moving to Buffalo full time and in time for the summer season. And um, we actually were able to sell our house in Cleveland. We closed on it uh, yesterday. <laughs> I've been a bit busy, and, um, and we are, uh, are in the midst of buying a house in Buffalo. So we're really looking forward to uh, being here and being a part of this great arts community. We're very lucky to have Matt with us. Now, Tim Smith, also new member in our trombone section, so some of you may have seen Tim back there. And Tim won his job against a tremendous pool of very talented trombonists, 116, am I right? 116 trombonists traveled to Buffalo for that audition. We listened to every one of them. And at the end, Tim was the only one left standing, right? He, he won the job. We didn't know it was Tim, of course, because that we, as you know, I think I've told you before, we auditioned behind a screen, so we don't know who we're choosing. We're just choosing the very best of 116 great trombonists, and it was Tim. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm actually from Reading, Pennsylvania, so not too far away, right in the heart of Pennsylvania Dutch country. And I was also forced to take piano lessons from a very early age. Forced is kind of a strong word. I was um, encouraged to take piano lessons. In fourth grade, we were introduced to all the band instruments, and like half of the fourth grade class, I wanted to play the saxophone. There was something about it. My dad had one in the closet. He had played uh, saxophone and bassoon when he was in college, not as a music major, but for fun. And a family friend said, mm, how about you try the trombone? Because my mom's always said I've had monkey arms. So that works really well when you have to reach out there on the trombone. Um, so I took up the trombone. And uh, a few years later, I really was getting into sports. And I, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. And I told my mom, I want to quit both. I don't want to do it anymore. She said, well, tell you what. Pick one, and you can still play baseball, but you have to still play an instrument. And I said, OK, I pick the trombone. And the reason for that was because both my parents took piano lessons as children, and they could tell when I was messing around on the piano. But with the trombone, <laughs> everything you do when you're that young sounds like you're messing around. So I could get away <laughs> with a lot. Um, and that's the way it remained up until about 11th grade. And at that point, my high school band director, who also taught me private trombone lessons, dared me to audition for county band. It was kind of an honor band within my county. And I got a chair in it. In fact, I made third chair, which I was really surprised to do that. And that also qualified me to play in the orchestra. And the best thing about this, at least when I got in, was that we got out of school to go to rehearsal. So I thought, this was great. I get out of school to go sit and play music. That, that's great. But when I got there, I, it was a great surprise. Everybody who was there really loved playing. And music was a passion for them. And a lot of these, a lot of these kids went on to go to music school, and I'm still friends with many of them now. Um, but it wasn't just the camaraderie of being in band and going on trips. There was something more to it. And that really bit me. And by over the next year of high school, I started to think, well, maybe music would be something really fun to do. So uh, I got online and I was looking at various colleges and I actually decided on music as a, um, as a major very late. I think it was about December or January of, of 12th grade. So that's, that's pretty late. Uh, and I went to Ithaca College, of all places, just not too far away and studied trombone. And I, I started out, I wanted to be a band director and I just fell in love with playing more and more every day and listening to recordings and being in my trombone studio. We had about 25 trombone students there at the time. And I just loved it. And I, I would, I think even times I would skip class just to go and practice trombone. So I don't advocate doing that, but it worked out for me. So, um, and at that point, I, I, I finished at Ithaca after four years, and I decided to move to Chicago, where I attended Northwestern University for my master's degree, uh, studying with players in the Chicago Symphony and the Chicago Lyric Opera. After finishing there, I, I stayed around in Chicago and freelanced, and this whole time I was taking auditions and trying to land my, my job. Uh, and I've spent some time in other orchestras, and I've been very fortunate to be here and, and win the position here, and I, I love Buffalo. This is a great place to be. So, 
Well, we're very happy, and the trombone section is very happy, Tim, as you know. Daniel Kirtilevich probably has the most unusual history of the, of the three of them. He, came, he moved here in September from Poland to become a member of our horn section. So tell us a little bit about your background, Daniel. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I was born and grew up in eastern Poland. And my adventure with music started when I was uh, 15 in military music high school. I'm a graduate of the Karol Lipinski Academy of Music in Wrocław. And uh, during my studies, I met uh, the Jacek Music. He's a principal horn in Buffalo Philharmonic. And uh, I was a principal horn in Wrocław Philharmonic and Polish Radio National Symphony Orchestra. And it's my first season with Buffalo Philharmonic. And I'm very excited. I'm very excited too with my new colleagues. We're very excited to have Daniel with us. When we were looking for a horn player, of course, we were discussing things with the Atsek, whom you hear all the time as our principal horn, about what, what we should we do to fill this position. And Jacek told me about Daniel, who, what's your age now, Daniel? You're 20? 24. 24. He met him um, when you were still in the army, right? Playing music in the army? Yeah. It was five years ago. Five years ago, I mean, he got his music background in, in the Polish army. And Jacek told me he was giving a master class and he discovered this young player with an enormous talent. And he was so impressed by him that uh, he stayed in touch with you and then he suggested to us, let's bring Daniel here from Poland. And, and he was very lucky. So he's been your mentor, right? Yeah, and, definitely. And, and, um, and Daniel has made a fantastic addition to our horn section. So. We're very proud of all three of our new players, and I wanted to give you a chance to welcome them. So thank you very, very much.